Th thank you, Rich. Um, so uh, thanks again for uh, you, John and Rich, and the invitation to uh, uh, give a talk. I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, one aspect of soil uh, science and soil morphology that is difficult to characterize that particularly relates to urban uh, settings. Um, and it's an area of research that I've been engaged in for the last uh, uh, decade or so. Uh, so um, as has been said before, um, just to start off this uh, presentation, if we consider what soils do for the uh, urban environment, what soils do for us, um, uh, there are three major categories of things that uh, the soils do for us. Um, they provide uh, a growth medium for plants, um, and that is that they store water and nutrients, uh, they recycle organic litter, they provide uh, homes for microorganisms like uh, mycorrhizae that are important for uh, plants and the uptake of phosphorus. They regulate and partition the flow of water. So there's a very hydrologic, there's a very important hydrological implication for soils. It controls infiltration and runoff and therefore um, flooding and, and erosion. Uh, governs water infiltr or water retention and uh, the recharge of water to ground, uh, to groundwater. Um, it determines water residence times, how quickly the water uh, can move through the soil. And um, another major um, function is that it buffers environmental change. So it recycles waste, uh, it filters our groundwater, and um, of course, um, as has been mentioned before, a very important function is that it absorbs um, atmospheric carbon in the form of soil organic carbon. Okay, so um, one way that we conceptualize the soil is, to, uh, is to, to think of the soil into what it's composed of. And um, if you've uh, been introduced to soils or know a little bit about soils, you know that uh, if you take a cube of soil, uh, about half of that volume is, um, is composed of solid material and the other half is composed of pore space roughly. Uh, that uh, solid phase is uh, divided up into either mineral matter, which is the majority of the material, um, and also um, organic matter. And the mineral matter is defined um, or, or divided into fine earth and coarse fractions, things like sand, silt, clay, rock fragments, and the organic matter can be living and decaying. But that pore space is, um, that 50% of that volume that's pore space uh, can either be filled with air or water. And so it's very important. Now, the way that we oftentimes conceptualize the soil when we describe it is um, leads people to believe that the material is uh, relatively well mixed. And so that is that these components are randomly distributed within the soil. Um, however, the reality is that these um, particles are actually arranged into clusters. Um, and we call these clusters aggregates um, or PEDs. And the arrangement of these primary particles um, is called soil uh, structure. And it's that, it's soil structure that I wanna focus on today. So here's a couple of uh, photos that show um, soil structure at different scales. And um, so not only does the soil um, aggregate, but it aggregates at different scales. So we have a scanning electron micrograph that shows uh, the clay, uh, uh, clay uh, uh, tactoids that are associated, these clusters of clay particles that are, that are together. Uh, we have a photomicrograph uh, here, a thin section that shows the, the, these narrow channels between clusters of soil material aggregated by calcite. Uh, we have a, a centimeter scale aggregate that's enmeshed in roots and, and uh, uh, fungal hyphae. Um, and, uh, and then we have at the level of a pit, if you were to dig a pit and look at the soil profile, it often times contains these very large um, uh, ag aggregate units, which we call PEDs. In this case, these are prismatic PEDs um, that um, have this repeating structure to them. And this is, this is very important. Uh, so, so why is it important? What difference does this make? Well, it makes a, a very large difference on water retention and pore size distribution. So here I'm, I'm showing on the, on the y-axis here, uh, water retention is, is essentially the amount of water that a soil can hold under a different under, under a given force. And on the y-axis here is the, the amount of water that's in the soil. On the x-axis, this lower x-axis, is the amount of, or the potential energy it takes to pull that water from, uh, from the ground. And um, if, you can, uh, if you can see, you start off uh, sort of saturated and then you decrease. So as, as the material gets drier, uh, it requires more and more suction by the plants to pull that water away from the soil, from the soil pores. 
Now the derivative of that curve is shown here in red, and this is essentially a, uh, a distribution of pore sizes. And so you can see that uh, for the most part, our pore sizes are relatively small. So this is an example I'm giving here for a non-structured soil material. So we might say, well, what, is, what, what does this look like under structured conditions? Well, under structured conditions, we get a, a bump here at the wet end of the curve. Um, and the, the consequence of taking a bunch of uh, particles and aggregating them together is that it creates these very large pores um, on the uh, wet end of the curve. And so we get this bump here of large, large pores. And that's because as we cluster the particles together, we get larger pore spaces between those clusters. Now, the reason why that's important is because um, it has such a large control over, uh, over hydrology. So the infiltration of water into the ground, uh, the, the flux of water through the ground, and then the, the drainage of that water to groundwater resources um, is determined by those largest pores. It's been estimated that uh, the largest pores in the soil, what we call the macro pores, only occupy about 1% of the volume, but they are responsible for over 70% of the water flow through the soil. So their importance really just really can't be uh, uh, overestimated. And the reason for that is because of this relationship, this uh, Poisset's equation here, which relates the volumetric discharge uh, Q uh, to the size of the pore that's going on and uh, the size of the pore that's transmitting that water. And so what you can see here is that the R is raised to the fourth power. So what that means is if the radius of the pore increases just by a little bit, the volumetric discharge drastically increases. And so uh, just a slightly bigger pore can transmit so much more water than a smaller pore. And so that has a, a big influence on um, the biogeochemical reactions in the soil. Um, we can create domains in the soil that are saturated and, and undergo redox reactions. So denitrification, um, uh, heavy metal toxicity are controlled by redox reactions and so is carbon mineralization. And then the other aspect of aggregation is that the organic matter gets protected by the particles within the aggregates from microbial attack. And so, uh, so the accessibility of the organic matter to microorganisms is, uh, is influenced by soil structure, and so it influences carbon storage. And then water flux also controls contaminant transport, and so therefore structure controls contaminant transport. Another urgency about soil structure, which was relatively surprising, this is a study we published a few years ago. Um, and what we found was that although the typical uh, idea of um, the soil structure naturally forms uh, with soil development over centuries to millennia, what we're finding is that actually the structure is responding much more quickly than we expected to climate. And that it's, uh, it's, it's uh, a different relationship than we expected. It's a, it's a, ne it, it, it's a negative, uh, uh, there's some negative hydrological implications to this. As, the, as we get uh, areas that get, are expected to receive more rainfall, the macro porosity is actually going to decrease, which means it's going to be harder in those areas that get more rainfall for the land to absorb that water. And so potential for greater frequencies of flash flooding um, and events uh, such as these. So, uh, so there's some urgency here that just beyond what we do directly in urban soil management, uh, climate is, is, is uh, uh, a very important player in, in, in understanding hydrology here. Now, the way that we characterize the soil currently is through uh, physical methods, things like water retention that I mentioned, and aggregate size and stability. But these are all proxy measurements. They're not directly looking at the aggregation of the, of the material. They're not looking at the arrangement. Um, we can use field-based morphological descriptions. So the NRCS uh, will go out to the, uh, to the field and they'll dig a pit. And Randy will talk about this, I'm sure, in a, in a minute. Um, but uh, they will describe all kinds of properties of soils in the field. And one of those properties is soil structure. And so they'll describe it in terms of these qualitative classes, things like subangular blocky or angular blocky or wedge. And then they'll give a size uh, class to that uh, information. It's all very useful information, but the problem is it's very difficult to take that qualitative information and uh, use it for uh, an assessment of soil health that is supposed to be a little bit more quantitative. Also, it's difficult to examine the change in soil structure and, and put it into any kind of quantitative prediction model. So recently, there have also been imaging approaches that have been 
promoted. And one of these is um, uh, things like uh, uh, x-ray computed tomography. But the problem there is that the samples uh, that are required for that are very, very small. So current methods are inadequate because they only indirectly examine structure or are very limited by scale. And I've got these two quotes here. Uh, the first one is from S.J. Richards. And, and this kind of gets, gets at the idea that soul structure is very hard to characterize. Soul structure is one thing soul physicists all talk about, but no one seems to know what it means. Um, another quote from W.D. Kemper is that almost every U.S. soul physicist somewhere in their career undertakes research related to soul structure with the expectation of making a meaningful contribution to the topic only to give up in dismay after one or two studies. And that's because it's just a really tricky thing to try to try to understand because of the scaling relationship and because it's so irregular. So despite those problems, though, there are several technologies that are really promising um, that have come out in the last couple of years, um, or I should say over the last uh, about 10 years or so. Um, and these are ones that we focused on in, in our lab, but there are other labs that are working on these too. Um, and the first one is multi-stripe laser triangulation. And the second is hyperspectral imaging. So with the multi-stripe laser triangulation, this is a technique where um, uh, laser stripes are, sh are, are um, projected on a surface and then they're swept across the surface. And uh, we can do this either in the field or in the laboratory. And as those laser lines are projected across the surface, the surface topography is uh, characterized as is the pores between those aggregates. And so what we're able to do um, really for the first time is um, very uh, in a very high resolution and very large scale, we're able to take um, the pores of a surface that's shown here. Uh, this is a, an example of a, of a prepared surface that was scanned by MLT and actually map the macro pores that are there, which are shown in the black, uh, the black blobs here in the, in the, in the right. Um, and so we can image these macro pores, and then we can do things that take, we can take measurements that we've never been able to take on, on these pores before. Things like angles of the pores, uh, we can measure tortuosity and shape of the pores, we can measure the density of those pores. And this is really useful for moving forward in a quantitative fashion towards prediction models. Um, the second um, technology is hyperspectral imaging. And this allows us to, instead of just dividing the material between pores and solids, it allows us to say what solids are where. Um, so we can, uh, we can use this technique to determine the distribution of organic carbon, uh, of iron, of manganese um, across uh, the solid phase and in relationship to the pore space so that we can get a better assessment of soil health. So these uh, samples, th this technology can be used in the field, but uh, in general, uh, we take it, uh, we take uh, uh, steel trays, uh, uh, these intact monoliths of the soil, and we bring them back to the lab, and then we scan them uh, with this uh, visible near infrared uh, hyperspectral um, device, this camera. And the, the information that we get back is um, a very high resolution. It's about a 50 micrometer uh, pixel size. And for every pixel, we get a, uh, a responding hyperspectral curve that comes out. And that curve, um, is related to different constituents. And so we can use that and the signature of those constituents in this curve uh, to work out how much of different components of the soil uh, solid phase are there. So uh, for example, um, on the left here is an MLT scan. On the right is actually uh, uh, the, the mapping of all of, the, um, all of the roots that are there that have been picked up by the hyperspectral signature in this case. And so we can map not only the location of the, that particular kind of carbon, but where that is in relationship to the pore space. And then we can use geostatistical techniques to try to understand um, and assess um, its effect on soil health. So in conclusion, urban communities and ecosystems depend on the services that soils provide. Um, and the soil functioning and ecosystem services strongly depend on soil structure. And it's a, it's a topic that uh, I'm very fascinated with. I, I spend a lot of time studying, but uh, I think it's it's not um, it's such a foundational uh, topic, but it's 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 not uh, considered uh, oftentimes in assessments of soil health, or at least directly. Um, so beyond the direct effects of of what we do to uh, this to the land uh, through land use and management in urban environments, climate change is also uh, changing structure. So given its importance, that it's a foundational property, and the rate at which it's changing there's really an urgent need to directly characterize soil structure and to incorporate it into urban soil health assessments. 
Um, and um, MLT and HSI are, are these two new exciting opportunities to study and characterize soil structure at field scales and at resolutions necessary to resolve uh, soil structure across a range of scales.